My name is Kenneth Gears. I am a senior research scientist with Komodo, and I have 20 years in government with time at NSA, NCIS, and NATO. I'm Philip Palm Baker. I'm principal scientist with Komodo, and I've got 25 years of experience in web security, uh, beginning with the CERN web project, which I was a member of. The connectivity of devices in the past will explode in the near future because uh, we had about 4 billion IP addresses uh, in our current uh, language of the internet, IPv4, but in IPv6 there is unlimited, that you could address every atom in the universe uh, if you wanted to, uh, which means that, uh, you know, not only every toaster, but every uh, stick of butter and sock, uh, certainly the military, uh, will have an address and, and will keep track of it, which is okay for military inventory, but in the civilian space, this is going to have knock-on ramifications for privacy, human rights, democracy, uh, and we have scarcely begun to understand the impact of such massive connectivity. Well, every device that you own is a potential attack vector, in that every device you own is a potential bot. We saw this with the baby cam attack. Uh, a manufacturer was making these little boards that went into baby cams that were made by, you know, sold by a range of vendors and then sold in the Far East and somebody glued those together into a botnet and started attacking a company on the west coast of the United States, took down their DNS and took out a sizable chunk of the internet for a few hours. And so there you have a situation where a vulnerability in one vendor's product on one side of the globe caused chaos on the opposite side of the globe. And so we're interconnected and interdependent. And those people who'd bought those baby monitors hadn't been thinking, oh, I better buy a secure one in case the, uh, it's used to attack uh, West, Western United States. They weren't thinking, but what they were thinking of, oh, if I buy an insecure one, well, people can look at my baby uh, in creepy ways. And so there is consumer concern about security, but not necessarily concern about the full range of vulnerabilities that affect the internet community. Well, it's true, and we discover that the attack surface is bigger than we think, usually. So a friend of mine, uh, Charlie Miller, both from the state of Missouri, uh, hacked into a Jeep, you probably read this in Wired magazine, as it was rolling down the highway, and first uh, manipulated the radio, then the windshield wipers, then the air conditioning, and then cut the engine while it was running down the highway. Uh, and so, Hackers are, are smart, and they're kind of like uh, rodents that can find through, uh, through the, uh, the ground a, the easiest or least path of resistance toward a, uh, a fruit or a, a shelter uh, and that you hadn't thought of when you designed the house, perhaps, because you don't, have, uh, you don't necessarily have every attacker and every evil intention in mind at the engineering phase. Well, I have four separate SCADA networks in my car, which uh, is from the 1990s. None of them have security except for one network, and that's the one that the entertainment system is on, and that's to stop me from using a different manufacturer's CD changer. So the, the only security that's there not, is not for my protection, it's to protect the, uh, the manufacturer's bottom line. The bit about this attack surface, I mean, if you look at, um, I'm, I'm on a Facebook group of hackers uh, where they love to show a uh, blue screen of death on ATMs and uh, billboards and that type of thing. And many cases you've got uh, Internet of Things devices that are based on Windows 95 or Windows, 90, uh, Windows XP, which are, is an operating system that the manufacturer has stopped supporting. Mm -hmm. uh, the baby cam uh, was desktop Linux that they'd taken. And the problem in both cases is this is not an operating system that's been designed for Internet of Things. This is a desktop operating system with the vulnerability service of a desktop. So it's got all the services like 
tape backup, uh, typesetting, mail server, a whole range of code on that system that is vul has vulnerabilities and is exposed and it's completely unnecessary for the function of baby camera. And so one of the things I think that we're going to be seeing as a story next year and the year after is cores, which are operating systems that have been stripped down for Internet of Things use. And so instead of starting off from a desktop operating system and stripping it down, start off from the absolute minimum that you need and build up to what's needed to run an Internet of Things device. The challenge, though, is that in the uh, manufacturing or in the, the uh, industrial space, um, there's, a, there's always turnover, and so you need an operating system and an application that is relatively easy for a new person to understand. You can't expect, you know, the, uh, um, the original designer to be around forever, and so it will be designed so that new employees can come in and figure it out quickly which means that also hackers, they might be able to, if, if they can access a system, they can also find the red button that's turn it off, right? Or disable security. Uh, and this is a challenge um, because older closed networks that were proprietary and relatively unique now have common operating systems, common protocols, and they, they're designed to be user-friendly, which means they might be hacker-friendly. And then smart things, smart watches, and smart uh, cameras, and smart cars, and smart toasters, uh, means hackable. It means they've got sufficient functionality and connectivity that a bad guy could get inside them. Well, in many cases, they have this functionality, and they don't even have the security that's necessary, that's obviously necessary for that functionality. For example, um, Internet of Things door locks. Now, if there's one device that you would expect to have strong security on, mm -hmm. it would be a door lock from a name brand company. But uh, when you look at these things, uh, most of them use, at best, technology developed in the 1980s and broken in the 1980s for their security. And you can go to internet and chat rooms and you know, for 50 bucks, you can put together a device that will break many of the Internet of Things door locks. Well, there is have to be, in the future, some government regulation. Well, but before we get to government regulation, we have to say, what, what's the regulation going to be? So for security, we've got to start talking in terms of attack surface, i.e. what platform is used. We've got to talk in terms of cryptography. What's the work factor? The the 1980s chip that is used in your car to turn on, that's probably got a work factor of 20 bits. So that can be broken in a few minutes using a $5 computer. If people are selling these things, they sh you can now afford a 128-bit work factor, which provides you with, from now till doomsday, secure level of security, even if you're using a computer the size of a planet. That can be had for a few cents, and that's the level of cryptographic security that should be there by, def by default. So as an industry, I think that we've got to be coming together and saying, these are the criteria that you have to meet with your Internet of Things device. Until we've started to do that, though, I mean, what's the government going to regulate? Put a sticker on it? So thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate your time and attention. And on behalf of Philip and me, we really appreciate it. And if you want uh, any further information, feel free to reach out to us or go to Komodo.com. Thank you.